There are only two portions of the Constitution that reference the Speaker of the House. Article 1, Section 2 states that the House of Representatives shall choose their Speaker and other officers and shall have the sole power of impeachment. And the 25th Amendment describes the Speaker's role in presidential succession if the president is incapacitated as the second in line to the role. And then there is what you might call the Nancy Pelosi rule, which is the Speaker should never bring something to the floor that doesn't have the votes. Republicans don't seem to know either of those things. Today, they wasted another entire day fighting amongst themselves only to arrive right back where they started, speakerless. Lacking the necessary 217 votes, Jim Jordan temporarily backed off his speaker quest, agreeing to get behind a proposal to empower interim speaker Patrick McHenry until January 3rd, while Jordan would remain speaker designate. The closed door meeting went so well, former speaker Kevin McCarthy reportedly screamed at Matt Gates while another member lunged at Gates. The effort to empower McHenry and have some semblance of a functional House fell apart among Republicans, in part because it would require Democratic votes. I think this is the wrong thing to do. Our Republican voters work very hard to give us our majority, and this conference is broken. I worry that it might actually exacerbate the the divide we see in the caucus right now. It's absurd, but there was the biggest FDU to Republican voters I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so in the Groundhog Day fashion, Jim Jordan says the plan for now is to pursue a third House vote tomorrow, even as he continues to lose support and opposition is hardening from members who are getting literal death threats for not supporting him. Plus pressure from Sean Hannity. So here we are, 16 days without a speaker, less than a month from a government shutdown with two wars raging that require American funding that cannot get processed because Republic the Republican-run House is paralyzed. Good times. Joining me now is Congressman Jamie Raskin of Maryland, the ranking Democrat on the House Oversight Committee. I, I want to first uh, ask you, you know, I like to, to use your role as a constitutional scholar and take advantage of that because I could get to nerd out with you. But um, Speaker McHenry, that's the speaker for now, McHenry told Republicans at a closed door meeting that he would resign as speaker pro tempore if his colleagues pushed him to bring legislation to the floor without taking a vote to ex explicitly expand his powers. Are there any enumerated powers, and is it even legitimate to expand the powers of a temp speaker? Well, we are in unknown territory here. Um, you know, no party has ever uh, pushed the House of Representatives to this kind of uh, chaos and uncertainty before. Article 1 does say that each House can define the rules of its own proceedings. So, theoretically, in addition to the textual provisions that you invoked that refer specifically to a speaker, we could create a speaker pro tem, we could create a moderator, we could create an MC uh, for that matter. But then, of course, the question is, what is the authority of that person? Um, because has the House of Representatives itself acted legitimately if we don't have a speaker? And nobody knows. And, of course, that might have to be tested in court. So they are taking us to new horizons of chaos and parliamentary confusion that nobody's ever seen before at this right. point. Yeah, I mean, I don't think a speaker's ever been thrown out. I mean, they, they, they were really making history here. The other sort of thing that has been notable about this mess have been the, the tactics of pro-Jordan forces. We don't know who specifically is doing it, but the death threats. Representatives Marionette Miller, Meeks, uh, Drew Ferguson, they both got death threats for not voting for Jordan. Um, you've got other members. Uh, Drew Ferguson told Republicans he had to have a sheriff station at his daughter's school over threats. Ken Buck has said he's had four death threats and got any Evicted from one of his offices in Colorado. I know of other members who've been accused of being communists, but they happen to be Republican conservatives um, and, and some of Cuban American background calling them communists. I mean, like the tactics and even having Sean Hannity's producers pressure people, that also feels unprecedented and it doesn't even seem to be effective. Your thoughts on that? Well, this goes back to January the 6th, Joy, because if you fail to renounce and denounce political violence in very clear and explicit terms, it's going to come back to haunt you. So first they come for Vice President Pence and Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats, and then they come for Liz Cheney and they come for Adam Kinzinger, and then eventually they come to you. Anybody who does not completely toe the line of 
the Trump sycophantic MAGA right. And that's where we are now. There will be death threats. There will be intimidation. There will be political threats. Um, there will be calls uh, threatening violence to people's homes, to their offices, if they don't toe the line. And, of course, um, Jordan's forces want to now put the, you know, the, the pedal to the metal uh, and go forward again tomorrow, thinking this, by, this may be the point of maximum fear and intimidation, and they might not be able to recover, you know, whatever progress they've been made, they've been able to make up over the last day. I understand that Steve Bannon um, has been uh, exhorting his followers to turn up the heat in people's district offices, in their D.C. offices, and so on. But it's giving more Republicans a glimpse of the kind of intimidation and fear tactics that have been unleashed against anybody who stands in the way of Donald Trump and his preferred followers in Congress. I'm glad that you invoked uh, January 6th, because uh, Rachel Maddow was on with us last night, and she had a very interesting take and theory on why the, the purpose of all of this, what it may be. Take a listen. Having Patrick McHenry be, be named speaker without yeah. voting for him does not work in the American system of government. That is not a way out of this. And so uh, sometimes things go slow until they go fast. Yeah. And one of the things that has happened is that the Republican Party has effectively abolished half of Congress. And Rachel went on to say that maybe that's the point, that maybe the point is to have no speaker, to have effectively no government, to dismantle the government from within and essentially allow the government to close down, shut down in less than 30 days and fail. What do you make of that? Well, it goes back to Steve Bannon, who said when the first uh, Trump nightmares began to uh, sick themselves on the American people, we're going to deconstruct the administrative state, we're going to deconstruct the deep state. And of course, what they're really talking about is dismantling the Constitution of the United States. And that's why at every turn, we're just trying to defend essential constitutional functions. We want to pay the bills of America and not default on our creditors. We want to keep the government open and running rather than shut the government down. We want to make sure that the winner of the presidential election actually gets to take office rather than the loser through a series of outrageous tricks and maneuvers and violence. And so this is where we are. Um, Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin have set the stage for what we're living through now, which is uh, no fidelity to the Constitution, no commitment to democracy, but rule or ruin. That is the dictum that inspires the extreme right in America. They're either going to rule over all of us or they're going to ruin our opportunity to meet the needs of the people through government. Yeah, it is. It is pretty frightening. I do want to, while well, I have you here, since you were on the January 6th committee, give you an opportunity to comment on Sidney Powell uh, pleading out, um, pleading guilty uh, to now misdemeanors in the state of Georgia. Your thoughts on that? Well, you know, there were so many criminal offenses that were committed at so many different levels, at the state level, at the federal level, by um, a lot of the key participants in these events, that it doesn't surprise me that they will start to plead out in the hopes of um, escaping real justice and accountability um, in the process. So um, there are lots of crimes that are uh, obvious at this point. Um, it's very clear that th what was attempted on January 6th was a political coup, and that political coup was backed up by a violent insurrection that drove the House and the Senate out of our offices. But it had been taking place for many weeks um, and at different levels. And I think that all of these offenses are coming to light. I feel proud of what we did on the January 6th Select Committee, because even though we didn't have the power to prosecute anyone, we did have the power to tell the story. And it's that story that set the factual predicate for the prosecutors to engage in prosecutions all over America now. Uh, indeed. Uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin, thank you very much. We appreciate your time.